you performed uh, Lamb Lies Down 100 times live? I mean, you know, all over the... In its entirety. Yeah, yeah in its probably entirety. Probably that isn't, wasn't quite, but probably not far off that, yeah. Um, it must, it, that sort of stint must have changed your feeling for it, the way, the way you played it. There must have been lots of things that you picked up on the way that might have made a difference. Well, I suppose so. You kind of, when you, you know, we're very much a sort of, we're a writing unit. So we tend to write music and then when we're performing, we're performing what we've written. So things don't change all that much. Um, there were various improvised sections on the lamb, uh, the little bits and pieces, which in many ways are some of the favourite bits on there, you know. Um, you know, whether they were sort of quite big pieces like Flannel Windshield, where we would do what we wanted, which, you know, I think is one of the best moments on the, on the record. And then other little tinkly moments, you know. Um, like Silent Sorrow and Empty Boats. You know, these things just had a lot of, lot of character and they were improvised, but when we played the other songs, they stayed fairly much the same. And, uh, you know, you didn't do too much with them. I, th I, don't, think la I don't think even when we played um, Cage live at that point, for example, it was as good as it later became. You know, we made it much more of a rock song, I think, after that, and it was, you know, it sounded a lot better. Because you were playing it in, uh, in stadium shows in the 80s. Well, we played it through, yeah. throughout our career. We sort of never kind of could lose it. <laughs> it just became, I think, a, a sort of a really strong moment from there. I mean, when we'd finished The Lamb, it was my decision. I really wanted to do that song live because I felt it was much better than it had ever been. You know, so when we started doing, um, as of, you know, when, when after Peter left, it seemed a logical song to go back to. It just sort of had such a strong power to it. And it'd be a great song to take out of context. I mean, could, we could have chosen that. We could have cho chosen Back in New York City, but that depended a bit more on Pete's vocal performance, you know, want to just a good really sort of rock song and try and get get rid of the sort of troubles. Everything associated with the lamb became a little bit kind of arty farty in a way because of the lyric, you know, it tended to make it a certain sort of thing. And you could sort of take something out of context like in the cage and you pretty much could get away with it. Um, if people didn't listen too close to the lyrics, quite sure what's going on in the middle with Brother John and all that. But the, you know, you, it just sort of sounded really good. And these sort of words like salic might, salic, there's just a lot of power in that thing. The the kind of um, emotion that that you find in in Genesis um, in the earlier earlier years is very much associated with the, I guess the pacing Peter's voice but your sound you know as as I was coming here I was listening to Supper's Ready <laughs> um, and uh, there's an extraordinary sort of um, flow of of different emotions going through that you know um to what extent was all that just just uh, accidental to what extent was it was it calculated well, I think and worked a, out there's a bit of bit of luck in it but the, we like to play with contrast i probably was most into this idea you know i i was always trying to sort of steer away a little bit from just doing straight ahead you know pop songs i think we all were to some extent but perhaps i was the one who kind of wanted to carry it the furthest and, you know, the idea of linking a quiet bit to a loud bit to try and make the loud bit sound louder than it did if it was, you know, on its own. And then we had, um, and Supper's Ready was an interesting one, really, because we, the first part sort of thing I'd written on guitar and, you know, we're developing it and it was turning very much into a sort of musical box part two. And I just, at a certain point, I just thought, we, Peter had written this song called Willow Farm, totally independent of everything else. I said, We'd just done this very pretty little bit, and I thought, well, it would be just great to go into that bit suddenly, without any kind of real reason or anything. And, and the contrast made it sound really great, I think, because it made Willow Farm sound even more insane and kind of, you know, uh, distinctive than it actually was. And it's a great piece of music, and you stuck it in the middle of that. And that totally transformed the song after that, because from then on, we were sort of very much into, you know, we were into, into playing, all of us playing um, you know, I was on keyboards, obviously, by then and everything, and the whole thing took on a much grander level, and we were able to, to make much more of it. And, you know, particularly the kind of Apocalypse in 9-8 section, which, you know, was so sort of we left it as when we were actually joined the writing stage, it was fairly free, and then it was probably the first time that Mike, Phil, and I very much worked together on something, and we just we sort of wrote that whole bit, um, you know, as a keyboard solo, but with the sort of the basis from what the other two were doing. Um, and then developing into these really big chords at the end, which when I originally wrote th those things, I originally saw it as a, as a, as an instrumental piece, you know. And then Pete started singing on top of it, which initially sort of was a, what's he doing? And then of course it just sounded so fantastic, you know. 
it just gives you a sort of somewhere to build to, I suppose. And a lot of it was luck um, and things, and some you know some great imagery from Pete's lyrics on that. Did you um, did you do these things in sections? And when you said you you, you Mike and uh, and Phil worked on on that piece, mm. was it like a separate section which you were then you you knew where it was going to go and you. You, did you stitch it all together? Yeah, pretty much. We knew where it was going to start and where it was going to end. We'd sort of come into this idea, you know, and um, it just sort of, I suppose, I can't really remember exactly how I did it. It probably went into the, the into some sort of rhythmic thing with the, the, the opening chords of that, you know, with the Guards of Magog bit. And then we needed to get somewhere at the end of it. I, I honestly can't remember everything, but all I know is that we left it fairly free and then developing it quite late on in the, in the, in the game. And, you know, we were sort of, you know, still kind of, putting it all together when we finally got in the studio, I suppose, with that. And uh, as, as was said before, I mean, it was the first time we'd heard it all the way through. Although we'd played it all the way through, to be honest. Um, we heard it, you didn't hear it back till we edited the two bits together and then found that actually the two bits were slightly out of tune with each other, which was an interesting moment for Mike and I. Um, we were in another studio and we had to sort of slow the tape down slightly to get the two in. And it sounds very peculiar, but... Everyone thought, oh, that's, that's really sort of artistic, you know. But as it turned out, in fact, when we came, what was a strange thing was when Nick and I came back to doing the remix of this, we found that the two bits were actually in the, in the same key. There was no problem. What the problem was was with the, with the machines in the studio, we'd done the, the edit. One of the machines was running slow. So there you go. That's, that's how it turned out. So we didn't have to do this slow down thing. Because obviously nowadays we could have put them in the same key without any problem anyhow with modern electronics, but um, it was just, just, just that. Anyhow, it's a little, little moment, really. Um, the thing about Sub is ready, it strikes me, because it, it's worth f focusing on it for a minute, because it, it's one of the, the kind of big classic numbers from Genesis's first period, uh, very popular still. Uh, it, it's the, the, you know, the sort of banality of somebody saying Sub is ready, and then the the mystery of of the language that surrounds it, coupled mm. with this this extraordinary musical feel, you know, the atmosphere which you're giving it. Um, I mean, I I think that's one of the attractions of it. It's it's one of those things that one can puzzle about for for many a year, as indeed some people have, you know. Mm. Um, well, I think in terms of when Pete suggested calling it Supper's Ready, I think I said, no, we've got to give it, call it something else, something more epic. <laughs> but actually it was, it was great because what it did was it made it sort of like, sound like a throwaway title for something that was so long and ambitious, you know, um, and obviously sort of vaguely related to the, to the lyric, uh, certainly of the first, the first bit, you know, and all the individual titles in it all the way through a little bit, perhaps a little bit too clever, some of them, but it was sort of gave it a, it's part of the character of the piece. And I think it's, you know, was the, happens to be the longest but it probably is the sort of standout um of that of the early period with peter i suppose that you know i mean some people would two or three other songs that might be up there like musical box or perhaps further fifth perhaps cinema show you know but supper's ready is very much i think it's my favorite from that period definitely um going back to the sort of early early stages when you you guys were starting up um I'm, I'm just wondering where this was coming from, this, the kind of, you, you're sort of drawing on a little bit on folk music, but you're also very keen on um, pop and rock, um, and you're trying to do something a bit different with the sound, you're aiming for a different sound, even, even early on, even with the, the, the Genesis to Revelation stuff. Am I right? Well, yes, I'm not quite so sure with the Genesis Revelation, really, whether we were trying quite so much to do other things. It's, I think what we felt was that we loved all this music we'd been brought up with and everything, but the idea of taking it a little bit further, which had been suggested, you know, to some extent by groups, you know, obviously um, like uh, Procol Harum, I suppose, with the, you know, the Sean O'Brightley album, and groups like Family and Fairport Convention, you mentioned the folky thing. We were very keen for Fairport Convention fans at the time, those first two or three albums. Um, Sandy Denny's voice, you know, it was beautiful, I think. And the whole, I think this was quite influential on us, and you just wanted to try and do it. You see, people always assume that because you do all this sort of long, complicated stuff that you don't like the short stuff. But, of course, you do. It's, it's just the fact that someone else is doing that really well 
So why bother to do it almost, you know? You think, well, I mean, I, we're not going to write a song as good as I want to hold your hand, like I want to hold your hand. So, but we can do something, we can do something like Supper's Ready, which no one else has ever done before. And, you know, that's much more fun for us, I think. Um, we always tried to do the short stuff as well. And we, as I say, we got better over the years, but we had, you know, whether it was Harold the Barrel or I Know What I Like, whatever. These things are more concise and we enjoyed doing that as well very much. So, you know, so we were trying to do and we found an audience that we could take with it, with us. And the interesting thing about longer songs is that they do work so well live. Um, if you, you go to see groups who've got a succession of hits to play, and somehow it's very difficult to build up a real show. Yeah, audience love it. They hear, oh, another hit, another hit. That's great and everything. But, you know, when we played live, the shows, the songs that have really stood out have been, obviously, you mentioned in the cage and Afterglow, which sort of tends to be co together a lot. And then, obviously, later on, things like Domino and Home by the Sea, which are probably the, the, the classic songs from the later periods. Well, neither of those were singles or even any attempt at being a single, and yet they worked so well live. You could do things with them. Um, you had a chance to build an atmosphere. Worked very well visually, obviously, and, and just were very exciting. You could really build to a climax with both those songs. And um, you could intersperse them with, with the shorter stuff, the hits, the visible touches, thrown all the way and everything. And you could get quite a good show. And I think the Genesis live show benefited from having the two, the two elements. But there was the long songs that were the, the key. So the, the influence of uh, folk music, I mean, Fairport Convention clearly were, you know, brilliant of, of, of their type at that time. Um, how, was this a challenge? I mean, how could you kind of listen to that stuff and say, OK, well, we are... As a kind of folk music, but we're going somewhere else with it. I don't think we thought it was never that conscious, really. I mean, Mike and Ant, the original guitarist, obviously, you know, they, they listened to that. And the combination of guitars, you know, and you listen to a song like Fothering Gay, you know, um, it just was incredibly appealing. So this idea of two guitarists playing and not playing the same thing. So you've got this interweaving parts and harmonic things going on that you didn't really know about. And the thing about Felpal Convention is they introduced a kind of pop element into it, and that's what made it so appealing. It wasn't kind of wasn't the sandals and, and beer and, and beards, you know, it was something else about it. I mean, I, I think the, the group, perhaps, particularly after the, after the later, later generations of the group, changed into more of a folk act than it was in those early two or three albums, you know. Um, so they, they were, you know, one of, I don't want to overstress their influence, they were one of many influences, you know, and we loved the sort of, let's say, the family with that sort of shrieking voice and drums and stuff, you know. Um, and I probably I liked very much the sort of uh, the rather pretentiously titled "In Hell Twas in I," I think, which was on um, Progo Harm's album because it was a sort of longer piece that involved lots of little sections. Um, you know, back in the days when Matthew Fisher was still with them, and you got these little things going on, which were really really good, I think. So all these things were sort of like suggesting a way of doing it that hadn't really been done before, but none of them had really gone full whack. And we thought, well, we can go further than this. Um, and one, you know, and the idea of you're making much longer pieces, and we did this with Stagnation on Trespass and then Musical Box more successfully, I think, on Nursery Crime, where you, you didn't repeat. You took an idea, you started off, you went somewhere else, and you tell a little story with the music. Over 10, 12 minutes, you could do that. Supper's Radio is 26 minutes, with very little repetition, maybe the odd little reprise in there, but mainly going, telling stories. So you weren't, con you hadn't have to go to the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle, late, verse, chorus, you know, which is what so many songs wear. Um, and you could try and do more things, use more chords, more rhythms, have a bit of fun. <laughs> and some people liked that. Uh, where did the telling little stories come from? Was that, was that from Peter or was that all of you saying that that's the kind of thing? Well, I know. I think in the early days, we were just probably too self-conscious to express sort of real thoughts and emotions. So stories are a way of getting around that. So we all wrote stories, you know, I mean, to be honest, uh, you know. And that's how we did it to begin with. And, it, you know, there was rich sources to be mined, like the Greek myths were a good source, and, and just, you know, books, anything. Nursery rhymes? Yeah, well, the nursery rhymes, um, you know, just whatever took your fancy, science fiction books. You know, it wasn't later on that suddenly, you know, we started perhaps writing in slightly more, things embedded more in reality, um, I suppose, and, you know, tr even then we did it in a sort of quirky kind of way, you know, I mean, uh, uh, one of a very good lyric, I think, of Pete's early days was Get Him Out by Friday, which has kind of got a fantasy element to it, but is quite rooted in, in the sort of real real world as well. Um, and, you know, so you, you did it, and we just slowly evolved, I suppose. And then when 
by the end, you know, you, you start, you get less self-conscious and you can actually express more real emotions. Um, you know, still probably telling stories, actually. I, I mean, I've never really been one to express my actual sort of what's going on in my life in songs. It'd just be too boring. So kind of you take a real situation and then, and, you know, you take it into a different direction and, and produce a result. So that's... Um, that's sort of you know another fun to do, but in the early days it was very much that the, the stories were something to sort of to, to we found comfortable to to hide behind in a way.